I am a scenery making god is what some people have said about me. And today I am revealing all of my trade secrets, the ultimate 10 best scenery making hacks to take your terrain to the next level. Now, hubris aside, I have been making wargaming scenery for almost 20 years and model trains five years before that. I've built an insane collection of boards of all styles, starting out as a hobbyist, moving into the art department in the film industry, running a full commission studio, and now working full time building mental boards for you guys here on YouTube. I think I'm pretty qualified to share a few thoughts that you guys might find helpful. So let's dive in with number 10. Rubble and ground covers should always go down after you have painted a model. For many years, scenery guides in the wargaming space would advocate for gluing down sand and bark and other garbage, giving it a big old prime and then slapping on some paint. And surprise, surprise, it looks like unrealistic hot trash. For ultimate realism on any style of scenic landscape, from ruined buildings to a woodland thicket, the scenic elements, the rubble, the rocks, the gravel, the grasses and dirt should always go down after you have applied paint to your surface. By using the right scenic materials that are matched to your layout, you will unlock an insane level of realism. In the update of my Osgiliath board, we have the ultimate case study of these two techniques. The old board is simply a gravel mix that has been painted and dry brushed with greys. The new updated city block features a layout of city base ready rubble blended to match the rough paintwork of the buildings, which is then applied after the board is painted. And oh my Iluvata, look at at that realism. Those are real rocks, that is real aggregate that looks like it's been blasted straight out of that painted stonework. It's even more obvious for surfaces like grass, which brings us to our second tip of the day, the ultimate recipe for realistic natural ground covers. Now, natural landscapes like fields, woods, little rivers, although may look pretty uniform in a nice wide shot, up close there is an incredible variation of material. And to translate that to the tabletop, we need to build our ground cover in layers. As an example, have a look at some of my early grass fields. It is literally just static grass on a painted surface. Even the Pelinor looks pretty average, although at least the grass was applied over a blended grout foundation. The ultimate recipe is to apply a mix of gravels and aggregates, foam flocks, clump foliage and static grass all in one big pass. Here on this little section of an as unyet seen project, we can see I apply a layer of static grass down with light coverage and then sprinkle in light passes of different shades of foam flock and the scrublands base ready and applied in various concentrations. This breaks up the uniformity of the static grass layer and creates the feeling of little types of clover and shrubs growing up around the grasses, as well as the various exposed rocks and dirt layers underneath. Then we come to our third scenery hack. How the hell do we get insanely detailed boards, which are so layered with all these aggregates and different substrates of material to actually survive gameplay? And it is actually so so damn easy. All you need is the right materials. Now I use the Geek Gaming Matte Scenic Sealant, which you can buy from my store, ZorbaZorb.com, like all the materials that you're seeing in this video. But the sealant spray is something that you can make pretty easily well enough yourself, even if it is not quite as good as the Geek Gaming bottled stuff. It's essentially a blend of diluted PVA glue mixed with matte varnish, which creates a really strong bond between your materials to lock it all down hard. But the true key to long-term durability is all about the way the sealant is applied. To get the sealant and the glue penetrating down into the depths of the substrate, you need to create a capillary action to suck the glue molecules into the lower levels and lock down the foundation of your layers. Otherwise, the glue just sits on top and after a few knocks and bumps, the stuff underneath come loose and the whole system falls apart. So we do this by soaking the board with sprays of isopropyl alcohol or any high-proof high alcohol, really. I've even used vodka when I didn't have any iso left. Spray that down, and then before it evaporates, do a pass of the sealant. Alternate these two passes, working on small to mid-sized sections of the board at a time, and once that alcohol is down, absolutely soak that section of the board with sealant. Then, let it fully dry for about 12 hours, and do it again, and again, and again. A few passes for grassy, lightweight surfaces, and at least, you know, like five, six solid passes for those really heavy, rocky rubble blends. And as a quick aside, for scenery hack number four, when you are placing rubble, separate your rubble into different grain sizes. Put down your basing glue first, sprinkle the biggest, the larger size rocks, and then the medium, and then the fine grain sands. This ensures that all of your rubble will come in contact with some part of the glue base layer, and the whole level gets a foundation hold. 
Number five sees us go deeper into our landscapes as we tackle realistic landforms. But first up, it's time to hear from this week's sponsor. If Denethor, the steward of Gondor, had used the Surfshark VPN while browsing online with his Palantir, his data would have been secure from the Dark Lord with industry-leading measures using uncrackable encryption and the most secure VPN protocols. But instead of a safe browsing experience that doesn't log your data, when Denethor logged onto RohanSingles.net, the Dark Lord Sauron instantly saw the Minas Tirith IP address in the Palantir and sent forth his legions. In all seriousness, Netflix Australia is constantly dropping Lord of the Rings on and off the catalogue, which is infuriating. So I basically have it on a loop here in my workshop while I'm building. But with the Surfshark VPN, I can access it anytime I want simply using another country's Netflix, and it selects the fastest server speed by default. So make sure you don't make Denethor's mistake and get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals forward slash Zorbazorb and use the promo code Zorbazorb. The link is down in the description and you'll sort yourself out with 80 3% off and three months extra for free. Remember guys, if you use my links and support the sponsors that support me, it really helps the channel, it means I can crank out even more content. Number five sees us go deeper into our landscapes as we tackle realistic landforms, and as in all things with scenery building, it's all about layers. To keep your boards lightweight, you want to roughly mock out the core shape with some sort of foam substrate, but you will never get a realistic enough looking landform with just foam unless you spend hours and hours sanding it. This early version of the Edoras board took me hours to get the barrows working and they look fine, but man I could have done it in like 5 minutes if I had used some modelling compound. This stuff has completely revolutionised how I make landscapes, it's a plaster and cellulose fibre blend, sort of similar to paper mache, but it's incredibly consistent to work with, it blends and smooths out and in about 10 minutes it is rock hard and locked in place. It creates the perfect landforms and if you spread it thinly over your foam underlay, you can save on materials and keep the board lightweight. As we veer into scenery hack number six, it is also amazing for making rock faces. When you combine modeling compound with plaster rock molds, because the compound is a plaster blend, when you blend the rock molds together, the seams just completely melt away as the compound dries. With some clever face design by placing your rock molds in a realistic pattern, once the rock face is painted, you cannot tell what is rock mold and what is modeling compound. Now hack number seven continues our rocky theme and could quite honestly be my favorite technique on this list. List. It's another old school trade secret stolen from the model railway community and is the premier painting technique to create realistic rock work. And when combined with a little extra Zorbazorb spice, it just goes to the next level. It's called leopard spotting and it basically constitutes applying diluted washes directly to the plaster surface of a rock mold without priming it and relying on the absorbent properties of the plaster to blend the colors together into a pastiche of natural variation that imitates amazing stuff. Stone. Apply three passes with varied brighter tones, burnt sienna, raw ochre, thalo green, basically browns, yellows and greens if you're not all fancy, and then finish it off with a big all over black wash to blend it all together and tone down the brightness. Then as a little Zorbazorb flourish, I dry brush the piece heavily with an unloaded brush to rub the paint off the highlights, returning it to that slightly stained white plaster for those really nice milky quartz highlights, and then sprinkle some green blend foam flock and the the odd grass tuft, give it a soak in matte scenic sealant, and you have got amazing rocks for days. Hack number eight is actually the newest one to be added to my repertoire, and it has totally changed the way I paint Wargames terrain, and it's pretty f***ing simple. Use oil and enamel paint. Stop being a chicken and buy some bloody non-acrylics, specifically for washes and weathering. These things are amazing. I started experimenting with them for a Grimdark City painting tutorial that ended up never being made, actually, so if you want to see that secret footage come to light, comment down below. And I focused initially on classic weathering, so dumping thin lines of oil paint into recesses and then coming in with neat thinner on my brush and feathering out those edges to get lovely blends. But I also play with different enamels over the material italics for an all over wash with really low surface tension and it's just amazing for pin washing. And then the true revelation with these products came from the excellent Eric from Eric's Hobby Workshop who blew my mind with a stone painting scheme on our Minas Tirith build using a simple all over grey and then a brown weathering stain to complete some gorgeous stonework in two simple steps. I grabbed this with both hands and just went crazy with it, appropriating the method for the whole Minas Tirith board and as well as 
was the newer Skiliath Reforged City block, pushing it even further to play with a darker, blotchy stain with blacks to create really weathered stone, and I'm just in love with the results. Make sure you get the right thinners for the right paint and spot test them first if you're using them on foam, as some of the thinners will dissolve polystyrene. Our last three tips veer into the land of design, and number nine is a super simple principle. When you're building modular structures, always build your walls and floors as separate elements rather than your walls and roofs. So glue the walls to the floor, don't glue your roofs to your walls. This means that when you remove one layer, the layer underneath is still perfectly intact as a unique playable environment, and you don't have models standing on a floor with no idea of what cover they would be in from the walls around them. This is pretty standard stuff in places like the D&D community, but because of a lot of the plastic kits of the early 2000s, mostly from Games Workshop, encouraged a certain style of building because of their assembly system, I still see this approach happening quite often. Now number 10 and our final one is a two-parter, and it might be the most relevant advice I can give to any of you. Get inspired. Aim for massive projects. Go absolutely wild with your ambition, but spend a little bit of time planning and break down your goals into manageable chunks. Give yourself little dopamine kicks by completing small chunks to the finished state to empower you to keep building more and more. But also, don't spend too long planning. This is something I can be guilty of myself. I often lose days and days just conceptualizing a build, and the procrastination of finding the perfect design can be crippling. And the second part, is to get yourself a dedicated space where you can leave stuff sitting in a half-finished state. The best way to complete hobby goals is to chip away by sneaking a few moments here and there between the chaos of everyday life. I know a whole heap of you guys are parents like me or smashed with work, and you need to remove every possible obstacle between you and that project. That is the real secret to getting hobby done. Load up that audiobook, or you know, maybe uh, my entire uploads playlist, just cue it and let it go, and then get stuck in. In. So there we have 10 tips to level up your scenery game. Did you guys have any other big takeaways that I didn't talk about? Slap them down in the comments below. And I hope those little kind of bits of advice and little nuggets of wisdom from my many years of messing about in wargaming scenery. And if you guys really liked this format, let me know down in the comments below. It was great fun to put together. And so thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time right here on Zorbazorb Gaming.